How's everybody doing after lunch? Anybody snoozing yet? That's why my chair is here, in case I need to take a nap. All right, so thanks for attending. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking about Jenkins. Uh, who's using Jenkins today in their environment? All right, good. Who's using a Jenkins competitor? Still relevant conversation. So, um, you know, I've got a quick agenda. It says 33 slides, but it's not really, so it's a, it's a fake out. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction about myself, a little bit of background and vision. So really what we're talking about is before I was in consulting, I was on the customer side. I've done development. I've done operations. So this story was a real life story. It played out over three years. Um, and I'm going to talk about a little bit of the background of the company and kind of what happened and, and what we did, our approach to implementing uh, DevOps culture and processes. Um, we're going to talk about why, what, what our reaction was internally to the company, you know, what people were saying internally, and then a little bit of lessons learned uh, that we, you know, the summary of, of everything that happened. Um, so as, as she mentioned, I'm a consulting systems engineer, so what that really means is I go out with the sales guys and make sure they're not lying to you when they try to sell you something. Um, prior to that, I've done consulting before, and then I was over on the customer side at a bunch of different companies, insurance, um, government contracting, so a whole, whole bunch of different things going on there. Uh, my email's there. I have Twitter, but it's mainly jokes and retweets from Taco Bell. So probably not anything interesting there, but uh, feel free to shoot me an email if you have questions or comments uh, later on. So like I said, this, this story was really around, um, you know, when I was on the customer side and kind of what we, what we did there. So a little bit of background of the company. Um, they were in the insurance industry. Um, they are 10,000 plus employees. Uh, they were worldwide, so we had a spot in India, they were over in APAC, they were everywhere. Um, they, their main uh, source of revenue was their claim system. So when somebody filed a claim, that whole processing was done on a lovely stack that you can see there. It's TIBCO mainly and .NET were the big pieces. Um, and the big thing to talk about in IT was everything was manual. So manual deployments. Uh, manual testing, manual virtual machine provisioning, if they were actually provisioned. Um, so a lot of manual processes, and it looked like, you know, most companies that size back in 2013 when this occurred, right? So a lot of companies were really in that boat. Uh, when we look at the software development lifecycle, I broke it out into build and deployment. Uh, it kind of goes along with the story here. So you look at build, you know, you have your developers writing code, they check it in, and then they're done. Um, that's really all they did. Outside of that, there was this whole build team that actually go and build the, the binaries for any ver um, environment that was outside of dev. So testing, QA, production, and there was this whole you know, mixed match of processes uh, to get that change approved and actually deployed in those environments, right? And when you're talking about production, it was even better because you had a cab, you had to meet, you, had to, you know, get your change request approved by Monday for a Wednesday cab, and then it was scheduled a week later, right? So typical change management process at any large company. Um, and then the best thing about those, they were six, six hour phone calls starting at midnight. I used to be on those, those were fun. Um, with like 40,000 people on the call trying to figure out what was going on, right? So it was a lot of very heavy process. Um, and clearly, you know, the team that was kind of put together that I was on, um, you know, clearly you can see some problems with this process. Um, you know, the management of the company really wanted some change in IT. They said, we got to go faster, we got to get more releases out the door, but we got to be efficient because our, our incident rates are huge, right? We did some metrics to say incidents were categorized mainly in two, two errors, uh, areas. One is a manual whoopsie on, you know, the keyboard. The other one was a manual configuration error. Like, we're, we're configuring our applications wrong whether it's release notes or what, what's the problem. So that's kind of, you know, where we were. The management said, all right, we're, we're going we're gonna to have to change. We need to go faster. What are we going to do? All right, so we came up with this vision of changing the application deployment uh, process as a whole, right? The idea was we wanted push button code deployments that work the same in every environment. It's very simple, right? Everybody wants that because you want it to work. Um, you know, so what we did, we stood up a team called the Platform Ops Team. It was actually based out of the operations. So we, we uh, reported up to the operations VPs. 
And, um, you know, we said, hey, this is going to be what our goal is. And, you know, this is what we, this is what we want to do. We got support at the, at the VP level. Um, you know, we had actually a whole huge vision that was around virtual machines and stuff, but that's not relevant to this conversation. But this is really what we, we were focusing on and figuring out how to do this. Um, you know, typically, you know, this is an idea that everybody has. And usually you'll see something like this, right? You'll see an architecture here where you have a bunch of different teams. They're, they're pushing the source control. And then a trigger from, from a Jenkins master goes and executes the job on a Jenkins slave and then, you know, deploys to the environments. Um, well, there's a couple problems for our company at the time to do this. One, the biggest thing is that our devs didn't build their code. So you're going to let devs on a Jenkins master have admin access to go configure all the jobs with all the other teams that are also doing the same thing. And they don't know how to build their code. So there, that sounds like a really bad recipe for disaster. Um, you know, it's very tightly integrated here. So if one person potentially breaks a slave or the master, everybody else is going to suffer. And that was a huge step backwards from a really solid, structured, very slow process of having a build team build, build the code, right? Because we knew those people knew what they were doing, right? So we were like, ah, we like this, but maybe not, right? Um, so the, the platform op team, you know, myself and like three other people to start, uh, had never seen Jenkins before in our lives. So we're like, we have no idea what this is or how to, how to use it or even how to architect it in a way that is performance friendly for all the, the incoming requests that we know we're going to have from the devs. So how are we going to architect something that's awesome and the devs really want to use if we don't know what we're doing? So we kind of took a little bit of a different approach to the architecture. So we, we said, OK, well, this is going to be the first rev of the product that we, we push out to our internal customers of the, develop, you know, the development teams. Um, so the first thing we looked at is we're going to say, hey, let's, let's do a CI CD pipeline. Let's figure out what that is, for one. Um, but then we're going to also really kind of break this down into almost like a SOA-based process, where we're going to look at one chunk of the process at a time. Uh, the first thing we did was look at, okay, we're going to separ separate, build, and deploy out, very simply, right? And in order for us to do that, we said, well, we, we need to start with an artifact repository. That's going to be our main gate between developers and operations, because it makes sense for where we're currently at today. Um, so we also decided on the idea of build once, deploy many. Very simply, it still meets to our goal of uh, push-button deployments that work the same in every environment. And it also helps us uh, because it gives some aspect of control um, within the company. So we were bound by ITIL processes. So tracking everything, being, having something central is very important. All right, so this really kind of didn't talk about testing per se, but it was an idea to let's start, let's start a, the foundation of where we need to be. Um, next, we started building out the build process, right? So very simple, you know, continuous integration pipeline. A dev would write code, check it in the source code repository, trigger from Jenkins, would build the code, store, store the code, and then deploy into their dev environment, right? Because they had, you know, admin access to those environments anyway. We said, all right, this is very simple, easy as for us to do. We also gave access to the, that dev team on that Jenkins server. All right, here you go. You want access, here it is. Um, you know, the, the big thing here is that there was no formal requirement for any change request process to happen. So it was only a free for all. It's a dev, you know, dream come true that they get full access to the environment, they can do whatever they need, and nobody's stopping them, right? Um, so, so once we figured that out, we said, okay, let's, let's look at what deploy means, right? Because deploy outside of dev is a whole different concept because, again, we have these ITIL processes. So we had a similar but slightly different workflow for the other environments. So what we really did is we took away Jenkins access to all these other Jenkins servers. We, de we deployed a bunch of servers. We said, no, you can't touch those. You, you can learn on your own environment. but when you want to talk about going to integration and QA and prod and DR and all of the other ones that go behind there, we're going to give you this really slick UI. And all you got to do is log in. You got to select an environment, the change request number, your product, which is your product that you're working on, and the version that you want to deploy. And that's it. 
everything else is abstracted away, you have no access to Jenkins, and you have no access to the environment, right? But at that point, you know, they didn't really need that, right? So the idea is that a user would log in, they would select those things, and they would go and hit deploy. And what would happen is the portal would reach out and say, hey, ITSM solution, which was ServiceNow at this point, uh, can you check to see if the change request is approved, right? The change, uh, the ITIL process has been followed. And if there's a time window associated with that request, so for example, it's in production, it's, it's between six and uh, midnight and 6 a.m., are we in the right time window? And if it was, it deployed. Um, that's what would happen, right? So the idea was that that was the big trigger in the change request um, control around the same process Jenkins to pull the artifact from Artifactory and deploy to the environment, and we're done, right? So to make it more, pro uh, the process streamlined and efficient, we went actually went and met with a change management team. So okay, we've, we've streamlined deploy, but we still have this huge process before it. And you know, we got agreement with them that said, hey, we're gonna change this process, but we're gonna make it easier for you too. But we really kind of need a little bit of help from you to make this even easier. So we had this huge long form in ServiceNow of where are your dependencies, where are all these things that the developer needs to fill out. We said, if we can change this form to make it simple, you know, we can get your all the information you need. We can standardize the in, um, deployments and, you know, nobody touches the system anymore. And they loved it because it reduces risk. That's the main reason you have change management processes. You got to reduce risk to your system. So they loved it. Um, we essentially ended up with a code deployment time going from hours to a couple of minutes, right? Because depending on how, how long it takes you to, you know, log in and actually deploy the code. But also the change request process went from, I would say, 40 questions down to four and one approval, right? So the time it took you to stage your request and the time it took to deploy it was quicker than, you know, one of, the, one of those calls previously. So... So we, we found this process, we got agreement, and the devs loved it. They said, well, we can, we can deploy constantly now. Um, the one thing we didn't touch was testing, because we're like, oh, we can get you a certain way, but everything's manual, we'll help you guys, we'll help QA going forward, All right? So that's what the process was for one team. Now, if you look at multiple teams, just add more Jenkins servers, All right? The same thing applies here but they're gonna use the same gating functions, they're gonna use the same repository, the same artifact management system, and the same portal. Everything else was gonna be very distributed. All right, so you have a Jenkins server per environment, per team. All right, and you can see, kind of see how this is growing when you have more than, you know, two teams on there. And then, you know, Jenkins starts kind of invading and, you know, kind of taking over at this point, right? So the title of the talk is 37 Jenkins servers. I'm sure we ended up with way more. Um, but the idea is that it's an absurd number if you think about it in the context of what Jenkins should be doing. But if you look at the context of 2,000 employees in IT, that's a lot of people to use, the, use what you're actually putting out there. And how, how are you actually going to make it work? All right, so, so we got reception. We got some interesting reception from our internal stakeholders. Um, you know, we heard a few similar responses. The, the biggest one was, why? Why are you even doing this? This is crazy. Um, why, do, why is it so complex? Why do you have so many servers? Like, I, I don't understand it. But usually, when you're talking to a developer, and you just give them, hey, you have access to the dev server. You don't need it over here, but you have everything you need. They stop caring. They say, oh, I get what I need, um, I can, and I can move forward, right? So the, the idea is that the devs wanted to be in control, and they didn't want to wait. They got to do their work. Right? But the platform and team and anybody else in ops really needed them, the, the devs, to adopt standards. All right? So, so this, the, there was a carrot that we set in front of them, and it was an illusion of control. Right? Uh, you could have your own server, but you got to follow these standards to get there first. Um, so that actually worked pretty well. Uh, the other part of the why explained is all the other folks are, you know, we come to infrastructure and ask for a server. They, they're, why do you need another one, right? Why is your architecture so, so, so large? So the, the, for the non-devs or the curious parties in IT, went through the points of why we chose a distributed architecture. It made fairly easy sense. Um, you know, those terms, they all go through their architectures. 
The first one is flexibility. Like as a platform team who doesn't know Jenkins, uh, we needed flexibility without affecting our end users. All right, so again, besides one guy that we actually hired in that knew Jenkins, nobody knew how, how to work Jenkins. Uh, we knew how to architect things. We knew how to implement and support things, but we didn't understand Jenkins itself, right? So we also didn't have a lot of time. So how are we gonna figure out, let's just go the easiest way to, to get this out in production and figure out what our metrics are. How do we tune this later? Um, so we wanted the flexibility to be able to change our minds or have my, our minds change this for us by, you know, our managers to go and say, hey, maybe we want Bamboo next time. I don't know. Maybe we've, we've bought into Atlassian, we're, we're going to switch to Bamboo. Well, at the end of the day, if you do that with this architecture, nobody knows. Nobody knows what's behind the scenes, nobody knows what's behind the curtain, and the devs can just keep moving. There's no change to the flow of products going to production, right? Our, our users would be none the wiser. All right, the second reason why we need resiliency. So going back to those devs, they never built their code before in any environment outside of dev. You know, they're gonna be playing around, they're gonna be configuring their jobs, and then somebody's gonna break something. All right, if you look at that from, a, from the cultural aspect of DevOps, it's good to break things, but you also don't wanna impede everybody in the company, especially if it's you know, right before the third shift and the first shift comes back on. Right, so when there's an issue, it was isolated to that very team, to that very environment, right? So when a, a server was rendered out of commission, um, you know, it was on to that team to go say, hey, let's go fix it. Maybe we should probably not do that next time. Right, so when this occurred, the platform team usually got a call, hey, my version of Ant's not working or whatever. Instead of, instead of spending hours trying to figure out what was wrong, all we did was save the logs and reprovision a new server. Now, there was a parallel automation effort underway that the platform team was working on um, to automate a virtual machine. Right? So it included creating a virtual machine, getting an IP, installing components, and in this case, Jenkins was the platform that was being installed, and provide automatic access to the requesting team. So it was one of the first server blueprints that we put together uh, for teams to consume was this Jenkins dev server, right? So you can just log into servers now, click the button, five minutes later you get a server ready to go. Um, and then all you have to do is reprovision, uh, or sorry, decommission the server and it's act like nothing ever happened. Um, you know, that was the, one of the reasons why we were able to do that and provision as many servers as we needed right away. Um, the other thing we put together, and, and why, is we also put an adoption accelerator out. So we put together an onboarding kit. Um, it focused on what a RACI is, so we're changing their process. We've got to tell them who's responsible for what now. Uh, we, we actually put together some base scripts for TIBCO builds and TIBCO deploys, as well as .NET build and deploys, and say, hey, here's your jobs. Just use these. If you don't want to use these, you can write your own, or you can modify these and add features you want into them. Um, you know, so that was something we also provided. We also provided self-service. If you wanted to go do this yourself, here's everything you need, here's your instructions, or do you want us to handhold you all the way through, right? We had a, both parties like that. And we also then, then gave them a point of contact to call us for help, right? So it was very um, easy for them to choose their own adventure, per se, um, and to be able to take advantage of the new process, right? So all of these kind of ideas are really for focusing around how do I reduce the barriers to entry and also make it a, a sustainable system going forward? All right, so the last, one of the last pieces that we, we had a, as a why is supportability, right? So I'm a, on a platform team, all the people reported to me, but now we have all these servers to manage. Well, we, we at this point ate our own dog food and we actually provisioned another Jenkins server that was a maintenance server. So what we did is we, we, we just to, you know, put some simple metrics up, down, plug in versions sometimes because we want to know what people were using. Um, and it sent a daily report out. So it said, this one's down or this one's good. So we were proactive in understanding what, the, what was going on in the environment. We didn't have to contact any of the team to go talk what's in, what's in Splunk, what are your alerts doing, none of that because we could use our own server, All right? 
Um, and, you know, in this way, we're proactive to say, hey, your server's down or it's been down for this long. Can, do you need help? So it was a little bit more of an end user perspective of, hey, everything's, everything's good. Let me help you more uh, if you need it. And the biggest thing we did around supportability, um, and I have to mention it is 2013, so this is before Jenkins 2.0, so we had 1.5, I think, was out in production. Um, the, the management of those Jenkins jobs was something that we also managed. So anytime the job needed to be updated, um, our team was responsible for that, and figuring out where that was could have been a pain. Right, so what we did uh, is when we built a Jenkins server, we built it with an image of a specific job, and the job, lovely pseudocode here, really just says, it says, log into a code repository in a repo name, go pull this script with a certain label, um, and then download the script to the Lincoln, uh, local Jenkins server and execute. That's all it did. From there, that script was modifiable by devs in source control. So again, they never had to go to Jenkins, we never had to log into Jenkins to go change the script and update the version, we just changed the label. So in that case, we, our team never really had to log on the server at all, right? Um, so if the de developer wanted to change it, all you gotta do is uh, check out a source control, make some changes, check it back in, let us know. And it real quickly changed the label and we're good. We're good. So that also helped when they broke the server, we didn't lose anything, it doesn't matter, nothing was there. Um, so that was the biggest thing that we did. We really didn't have to manage our own environment because we made it very simple for us. All right, so those are kind of the big whys and kind of what we did from an architecture perspective. Um, let me just build out this slide. Okay. So, so mainly the lessons learned here, there's, it's more architecture forward, but it's really around motivations and how you get your devs or anybody else to adopt technologies that they don't know and you don't know yourself uh, with low barriers to entry. Um, I won't read all of these, but I will say is when you're thinking about architecture, software, microservices, whatever, be prepared for change. Be prepared for different owners of the, the tool set different changes to the underlying tool set, um, and abstraction layers are your friend, right? Because that's one way to help you solve and prepare yourself for change. Um, and that's it. I think I've gone on time. All right. Great talk, thank you. Did you hit any issues, were those teams all working on isolated features, or did you hit any issues with them like integrating down the line? Yes. <laughs> So we did, they were not isolated. This is old legacy code base, right? The biggest thing I want to point out here is, I kind of didn't read it out, but it's important is, um, does the branching strategy for each team really matter, right? And I don't want to point fingers, but at the time we took on this approach, we actually started there. We're like, how are we going to get the, the changes to merge? How's this all going to work? They were actually on one code base and nobody branched. Yes, it's very scary. Right, and we actually started the conversation there. It said, you know, we gotta, we gotta figure out good branching strategies. Should we do merge to master? Should we do developing on master? How do we do this? And the concepts of explaining branching and tagging to our build engineering team that was doing the builds was a month of our time, right? And, and the comment that we said, well, let's just label everything. I don't care how you branch. This is not a fight I care about. The devs should be able to figure this out. And if you can't build your own code, then let's, that's another problem, right? Um, and the comment we got back was, I don't know why we're talking about tags. Tags came out of the blogging world, right? So that's the, I mean, we did, right? And one of the things we, we recommended them do is to consolidate and the teams were associated with the branch, the master they were working on. So that's essentially how we solved it. Um, but that's kind of where we started. We said, this is a fight I don't want to, as operations, I shouldn't be telling you how to branch and when to branch and when to do a feature. Like, that's just not something I care about. And at the end of the day, it didn't matter because that was not going to get us out the door faster. Right? So we decided that was a battle we weren't going to try to fight. Hi. Uh, I have a question that's not related to Jenkins so much, but I see that you use um, Jay's frog artificer. 
Artifactory. Artifactory. Yep. Do you have any uh, lesson learned experience about how to deal with conflict when some dev want to use certain version and they want to put it on at the factory uh, process because we want to be system to be safe with a stable version, but people say, I want this, but it's certain features, and they just release it. Um, oh, with Artifactory itself? So yes, yeah, so what we did for every um, component of this architecture, the platform team owned a feature request intake process that said, you find this cool feature, tell us, we'll integrate it. Right, so that's what we did. We, had, we were acting just like a product team. So we'll, as a customer, tell us what you want. We'll prioritize it and with all of our work and if enough people want it, we'll go implement it for you. That, so that's how we, we took it, because we did have a lot of that. We had a lot of that with the scripts. We had a lot of that with Jenkins plugins. And we said, well, here's our standards. If you find something else you need, let us know and we'll work it like our own scrum team. So that's, that's kind of how we handled it. Uh, my, my question is, in terms of the actual servers that you were giving to these developers, uh, how was that working? Were they individual VMs or? Yep, they were individual VMs. It was a Windows based. Uh, everybody, it was a w mostly Windows company, so Windows based uh, Jenkins image uh, with a preset jobs configured, and then they got uh, admin access to that via a group group policy. All right, thanks.